Well, good morning, Midway Church. Great to see all of you here. I, I hope you've come and have already experienced great worship and celebration here in the room or in your home or wherever you are. So grateful for you and your consistency and steadfastness to connect, to study God's Word together. Trust you have your Bibles and are ready or you have your uh, Bible apps and are ready to get into the Word this morning. It's a great, great joy today for me to have uh, a dear friend and New Orleans ministry partner at Midway Church, uh, pastor of Connect Church, he and his lovely wife, Shanae. Shanae, where are you? Uh, Shanae's out there. So there's there right there in front of you, and two of their four children, and the other two are over in our children's department. We welcome all of you, and I want to ask you to give a good, warm Midway Church, West Georgia welcome to Ryan Rice. Appreciate your pastor. God bless you, buddy. Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, good morning, Midway Church. Thank you so much again for having myself and my wife here. Uh, on behalf of my church, Connect Church, we're thankful for your generosity as well as your w willingness to actually go on mission to help us to reach our city uh, with the name of Jesus Christ. And so I'm thankful to be with you this morning. If you're watching online, thank you so much as well for joining us. Uh, hopefully you have your Bible open and ready as we're going to be in the book of 1 John, of course, uh, this morning. Uh, I've been enjoying this series, walking through it with you guys. I've been able to catch up on it. And uh, it's been a great and timely series for the season that we're in right now. So if you have the Word of God in front of you, I want to encourage you to open up to the book of 1 John. We're going to look at chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 13. Verses 6 through 13. This morning I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible uh, as a translation I'll be using. And I'm going to read the word of the Lord to us, and then we'll jump into the text here. The word of the Lord says to us, Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given about his son. The one who believes in the son of God has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. The one who has the son has life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life life. Let's pray for one short moment. Father, I pray that as we expound upon your word, you would speak to us, speak through us. Lord, no matter where we find ourselves, if we're watching via online or if we're here in person, Lord, we know you're the same God in both places. And so, Lord, I pray that as our hearts will be illuminated to the truth of your word, we will be transformed. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'm thankful that in my 38 years of life, I've not spent much time in a court of law. Uh, so that means I've been a law-abiding citizen. However, there was a moment in my life where I had to go to court to serve as a key witness in a trial. If you've never gone through that experience, you have the sheriff's office show up to your door. They present you with papers, and they tell you, show up or go to jail. And you show up. And when you show up in the court... They have you, well, back in 2004 they did this, have you place your hand on the Bible and they just simply say, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you up, so help you God. Now, in this particular case, I was the key witness of an armed robbery. Yes, I live a very exciting life. I wasn't the one doing the robbing, but someone actually robbed me. And so I had to give the witness, the eyewitness account of what I saw and what I experienced so that the prosecution could kind of process their case. When we look at what a witness is, a witness is one who testifies. They give testimony of what is true and what they have experienced. In fact, in 1 John alone, the word witness is found no more than 10 times. John tells us that He's a witness to the testimony of truth. Yet, what happens, though, 
when we're closed off to the truth. Today in this room and watching online as well, there's several type of people in the room. There's the person who's heard and believed and received the truth. You know that you're assured in the truth of God. But yet there are those who are not sure and you're on the edge of truth. Maybe you're in this room and you're like that. Maybe you're watching online and you're right there on the edge and you're trying to figure out if what you're hearing is true. But then there are those who are simply skeptical or closed off to the truth, period. That no matter what they hear, no matter what is presented to them, that they're still closed off to the truth of who God is. In fact, we live in a culture where skepticism is celebrated and, in fact, expected where faith is seen as a blind thing instead of based on what is truth. In fact, one research study just did on those who profess to be evangelical or Protestant Christians show that 52% of those who profess to be a born-again believer believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. In this text, John is laying out for us the witness God gives, the witness that can be trusted, and the witness that transforms those who trust in it. So what are the witnesses John lays out for us? Let's go through a couple of them. Starting in verse 6, we see a witness of his baptism, witness of his baptism. I think we should revisit, firstly, why John was writing to the believers, In fact, he tells us in verse 13, he says, I've written these things so you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. So John is writing to give assurance, assurance that what we believe is in fact true. John gives his first witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He says, the water. Now, what is this water that John is speaking of here? Well, some have said it's the birth of Christ. And they're saying, hey, this water represents the way Christ came, the birth of Christ. Yet the context here, I think the best interpretation here is that this is speaking of the baptism of Jesus. We find the baptism of Jesus in every gospel account. Now, as we see this in every gospel account, one thing we have to take notice of is that it must be immensely important. We see in the gospel accounts that it tells of Jesus' baptism. As you may recall, John the Baptist, who was a prophet sent from God. In fact, he could be labeled as one of the last Old Testament prophets. He comes and he lives out his life in the wilderness, proclaiming a message from the Lord. And what was his message to the people of Israel? Repent, turn from your sin, change your mind about God, and be baptized. John was preparing the way for the Messiah. Now, think of it this way. This was a sinful people John is calling to repentance. He's calling a sinful people to repentance, to tell them to turn from their ways, trust in the Lord. John tells his people in Matthew 3, 11, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. So John was fulfilling his ministry right there in the wilderness. But then in this moment of John's ministry, Jesus arrives, and Jesus arrives and asks to be baptized. Now, if you're following along with this, it should leave you to scratch your head to ask the question, why would Jesus need to be baptized? Everyone else who was being baptized was sinful, but here comes the spotless, sinless Lamb of God to be baptized. Well, When we look at it in Matthew 3, 15, Jesus said, Allow it for now because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is following the command of his Father. He's fulfilling every bit of righteousness that was set out for him. But what do we see at his baptism? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our prophet, our priest, and our king. One thing we see at his baptism is that he, our great high priest, that this was his first entrance into the priesthood, into the, into the ministry that it was, he was called to. That at the age of 30, every high priest, in fact, had to undergo washing as well as anointing to do the work of the ministry. We see this picture there. But second, we also see Jesus identifying with sinners. 
In our own baptism, we see this reality. We just saw it a few moments ago. We see the reality of us dying with him and then raising up again with him, free from sin and able to walk in the newness of life. Lastly, we see the Father at Jesus' baptism affirming the Son, and we see the Holy Spirit there anointing him for the work that is ahead of him. We see the Father at his baptism, and this gives us proof that he was no mere man, that he was both God and man. In fact, in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. One note here is that at his baptism, Jesus was not made God. He's always existed as God. Jesus stepped into time. He's always existed. The Bible tells us that he did not find it robbery to be equal with the Father. In fact, these three, talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have the same substance and power in eternity. And the Son is eternally begotten from the Father. So John says, look, the first witness that we can point to to show us that Jesus is who he says he is, is we see at his baptism. But what is the next thing we see? We see a witness of his crucifixion. John says, Jesus Christ is the one who came by water and blood and blood. What is he talking about here? Well, God spoke from heaven proclaiming, listen to my son. This is my son who I'm well pleased in. And the son came from heaven, the one who came to live the life we could never live. He died the death that we deserved. The next witness we have is the actual cross of Christ. And John says to us that he didn't just come by the water through baptism, but by blood. And why was Jesus crucified? Well, they crucified Christ because he claimed to be the son of God. He was beaten, he was spat on, he was humiliated, but he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took on our sin punishment. He took on our debt. He took our place. When we look at prophecy, even in the Psalms, in Psalm 22, 11 through 8, it talks about the coming Messiah and how men would gamble for his clothing. This is all fulfilled. We see even in John, John 19, 23, 34, we see John's account of the soldiers taking his clothing and, and all, while he was on the cross, they're gambling for his clothing. As Jesus was crucified, we see several things that eyewitnesses give account to. We see the two thieves on the cross, one first mocking him, and they're both mocking him at first. And yet at the end, one thief asking Jesus to enter into his kingdom. We see darkness coming upon the earth while Jesus is there on the cross. As Jesus cries out, it is finished. We see the veil of the temple being torn in two. This was no man doing this. This was all supernatural. We also see the tombs being opened and those who are dead raised up again, going into the city. Also at the crucifixion, we see the Roman centurion who was near the crucifixion after witnessing Jesus' death, remarking, truly, this man is the Son of God. See, he wasn't just some man on the cross. He was indeed the Son of God. He was the sufficient Savior of all mankind who willingly laid down and gave his life. And why did he do this? He did this because of love. He did this because he loved the world. This is the witness that John is pointing us to, to give us the assurance that who we believe in is indeed who he says he is. But also to those who are wondering, what is this witness? It is showing us that Jesus is a sufficient Savior. Vince Vitale of Ravi Zacharias Ministries said this. He said, at the cross, we see the absolute uniqueness of the Christian response to suffering. Only in Christ do we have a God who is loving enough to suffer with us. If you want to understand the distinct difference between Christianity and everything else, is that there is a God who stepped into history 
to become like us and suffer with us and has the answer to suffering for us. It is found in the finished work of the cross. We serve a sufficient Savior who has been touched with all of our infirmities and knows exactly where we are and understands even the path that we should take. So we see his baptism as a witness. We see the cross, the finished work of the cross as a witness. But we also see a witness of the Holy Spirit. It says he came by water, but not just by water, but by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Remember the implications of what we're saying here. If God is real, which he is, And if the Son came, which he did, and if the Spirit of God teaches what is true, then to reject this truth is to reject God. I want you to let that sit for a moment on you. To reject what we're saying here and the witness that we have from John, to reject it is to reject God. So who testifies for us? The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, will always speak what is true and speak what comes from Christ. He will lead us to Jesus and only speaks what comes from him. Here's what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John 15, 26. The word of the Lord says, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. The Spirit of truth is the witness of Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Bible says, yet there are three that John lists here, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, all three in agreement, all three pointing us to the assurance of who Jesus is. In fact, In Jewish culture, one witness was not enough to bring a charge against someone. It tells us that you needed at least two or three. John, culturally using this example here, is showing us that there's enough evidence to show us that we can have the assurance that Jesus is who he says that he is. We see this with the truth of the witness of the water, the blood, and the spirit. And how do you know if it's from the Lord? Well, the Spirit of God will always point us back to Jesus. I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters. I know we live in an age where absolute truth is taboo, but can I tell you something? There is an absolute truth in Christ. And he is showing us that we should be resolute that the witness we have received from him, we should stake our feet and be rooted in fully. It matters not where the culture goes. It matters not where the culture goes this way or that way. But for those who are his, we have a witness and a testimony that is true, and we're called to remain resolute in it. No, we look to the one who points us to his sufficiency. But then look at this. Not only do we have a witness from his baptism, we see the crucifixion. We have the Spirit of God testifying to us what is true, but then we have a witness from the Father. Of course, verses 9 and 10, if we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given about his Son. John is following the logic of this lesser to greater. If you're believing the human testimony that comes from John and the apostles, surely... God's testimony should be trusted as greater. If proof of his baptism wasn't enough, the blood of the Spirit, what about God the Father's testimony? And what does the Bible say about our Father? Hebrews 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. So that means what we hear from the Lord, we take as it's true because it is impossible for him, for him to lie. The culture may tell you that you can't trust the word of God. But yet to say you can't trust the word of God is to call the God of the Bible a liar. And how could the God who is benevolent and good and merciful ever lie? There are many that doubt that there is even a God. Yet Romans 1 tells us that every person knows there is a God, but they suppress this truth. If there is a God, which there is, and he has sent his son, which he has, yet we don't believe this truth, we are rejecting God. 
We believe the truth regarding the Son because God the Father has given it to us and it comes from Him. In fact, in John 5, 37, Jesus said this, the Father who sent me had Himself testified about me. I believe the truth about Jesus because the Father has revealed it to us. I believe in what the Father has said, therefore I don't call him a liar. In fact, if you are a believer this morning, whether you're here in person or you're watching online, you're a believer in Christ because the Father drew you to the Son. See, you can't boast in anything. We don't, can't wake up in the morning and say, oh, look how great of a Christian I am. No, it is all by the grace of God. As the Apostle Paul remarked, I am what I am, but by the grace of God. Yet you may say, well, how do I know then that this God you speak of is the true God? Maybe you're watching online and you're wrestling with that thought right now. You're wondering, is the God that we, you're hearing about, is he real? Maybe you're in person here and you're wondering, is the God we're speaking of, is he real? Well, we don't have time to go deeper into this, but simply nothing cannot create something. We know scientifically the universe is not eternal but had a beginning and whatever created the universe must be eternal. The creator who created all things would have to be first supernatural in nature because he created time and space. He must be powerful, exceedingly powerful. He must be eternal, meaning self-existent. That means he exists all by himself. And you know what that tells us? There's a God who does not need you or I. And if a God that you worship needs you in a way to make himself self-sustaining, that's no God, that's an idol. No, the God we're talking about exists all by himself because he must be omnipresent, because he created space and is not limited by it. He must be intelligent supremely because only cognitive beings can produce a cognitive being. He must be purposeful as he's deliberate in creating everything. And he must be moral as no moral law can be had without a giver. Now, if these things are true about the God who we're talking about, then we have to ask the question, is there any religion in the world that describes such a creator? Well, the answer is an emphatic yes. The God of the Bible fits this profile perfectly. The God of the Scripture is indeed supernatural, according to Genesis 1.1. He is powerful, according to Jeremiah 32.17. He's eternal. He's omnipresent. He's timeless and changeless. He's immaterial. He's personal. He's necessary. He's intelligent. He is purposeful, and he is moral and caring. One commentator said it this way. To reject the witness is to deny the truthfulness of God. He has spoken and acted deliberately and with absolute clearness, the testimony has borne. The things that were not done in a corner, the witness must therefore either be accepted or rejected because it simply cannot be ignored or explained away. I, I just want to put it up front to you this morning that if you find yourself in the room this morning, if you're wondering where I'm pushing you to, I'm pushing you to a decision that are you all in and have you trusted in this God who is sufficient and the one who gave us his son or are you still on the outside? No matter if you're watching online right now, yes, that is the call that I'm calling you to, to trust in this sufficient Savior who we have a clear witness from. That he is sufficient. Well, what does this all lead? Well, a witness also of new life. A witness of new life. Verse, verse 10 says, the one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Now, Romans 10 tells us that confession with your mouth and belief in your heart that Jesus is Lord, this is what we're called to do. Believe that Jesus is Lord. Believe that God raised him from the dead. This is then the result of salvation. Now last week, you saw how John continually focused on the truth of being born again, walking in that love of being born again. And when we come to faith in Christ, the testimony of this reality is now found in us. You have the water. You have the cru crucifixion, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Father, and now eternal life gives a testimony of what Jesus has done and his truthfulness is found in our hearts. 
John makes it clear that those who believe the testimony from God, they place their trust in his word, they become a walking testimony of the proof that God has given us his son. Now, here's the thing. I know where we find ourselves as a nation right now. I know that we have found ourselves in a season where our testimony is more political than biblical. Brothers and sisters in Christ, my brothers and sisters online, if more people know of your political testimony than your biblical one, you're missing it. I just want to help you out a little bit here. Heaven and earth will pass away. However, his kingdom will remain forever. I want to tell you something. There will be one day no White House and no America, but there will be the kingdom of God forever and ever. It will be world without end. And I want to tell you something. The message our world needs is the message of his kingdom, and we must bear a testimony of that to a dying world. See, 2 Corinthians 5.17 should not just be a churchy cliche. It should be the reality of our life. If you don't know what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone, anyone, you want to know what that means in the Greek? Anyone. Anyone is in Christ He is a new creation. That means Republican. That means Democrat. That means Libertarian. That means Black. That means White. That means Hispanic. That means anyone. If you're breathing and you're not in the kingdom of God, we want to point you to the one who is sufficient to bring you into his kingdom. Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Is that your testimony this morning? But see, here's the thing. It could be your testimony, but yet you're not letting anyone else know about your testimony. I I mean, they know where you stand in all other aspects, but do they know where you stand for Christ? The new life of Christ in you says to the world what God has said is true. Peter went from being a fisherman to a fisher of men. He went from a man who denied Jesus to one who was empowered by the Holy Spirit and proclaimed boldly the message of Christ. It showed to a dying world that indeed the message of the Messiah was true. We also have, though, a witness of eternal life. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, verse 11. And this life is in his son. The one who has the son has life. And the one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You know, there's only two types of people in the world. I know that the the culture tries to tell us there are many, uh, you know, different types of people, although there are different ethnicities. There's only two types of people in the reality of it. There are those who are saved and those who are not. There are those who need the, the redeeming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are those who have it. No, the witness of eternal life speaks boldly. And to live and never die is a gift only God can give. In fact, Jesus said, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. John reminds the believers of this early on in chapter 2 where he says, and this is the promise that he himself made to us, eternal life, eternal life. It is so interesting that in our world, so many search for life. In a full, meaningful life, And place their trust in so many things and never find life. Maybe you're watching online and you're struggling right now. You're trying to find meaning in life. And you're trying to find where you are. And so you've put your hope in money. You've put your hope in your job. You've put your hope in politics and wherever you find yourself. But if anything this year has shown us, how short those things come up for us. The only thing that is still remaining steadfast and immovable is our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is where we should be found. In Christ, the scripture tells us that in order to find true life, first we find new life in him. We find it here and now. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it in abundance. And where does this new life come from? This new life is given from him who lived the life we couldn't live. 
and died the death that we deserved. His very life was given for us and then given to us. And because of the finished work of Christ, we are freed from the bondage of sin, death, and the grave. I want to make this statement really clear for us so that you can, you can without a doubt understand what I'm saying here. This is a gift we cannot earn. It is a person of Jesus Christ and those who believe have eternal life both here and in the life to come. Is this your story? Is this your testimony that you can say without a shadow of a doubt, without any equivocation, you can say that I have eternal life and I'm assured of it because I believe in the testimony of the Son. Why is this important? And why does knowing this even matter? Why does this even matter to us? Well, when you know your Redeemer and what he's done for you, your life is lived in a constant faith-filled walk. Our church has been doing a Wednesday prayer this whole month with all the turmoil that's going around us. And the thing I told them this past Wednesday, I said, you know what, when all the smoke clears, I want us to be a people that our eyes are fixed on Jesus and our feet are rooted in the foundation of Christ. This is where we should find ourselves because when you know your Redeemer, you know where your hope is. When you know you have eternal life, you rest that even when life is going crazy, there's always life abiding on the inside of you. Can I tell you something? We can be pressed down, shaken. The, the, the election can go not the way you want it to go. But can I tell you something? My Redeemer lives. And I'll stand on that day and will I praise him and worship him because he is good. When death comes your way, there is no fear because of the gift of eternal life. What can they really threaten Christians with? Nothing. Because there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God to those who are in Christ Jesus. How about this? You know you've received Christ. Why is this important? You know condemnation may try to come your way, but because you have life in, life in him, you cannot be condemned. But also your worth and value is found in what he's done for you not in what you can do. This is the good news that we have in Christ, that because of the testimony, because of who he is, we know who we are. So what is our next steps? Like, what are, what are our next steps as, as the people of God? Where do we find ourselves in this? I want to bring it back to where I started from. Today in this room and watching online, remember I gave you those Three types of people. There's a person who you've heard and you've believed and you received the truth. My brother and sister in Christ, I know the world is trying to shake you and shake your faith. And I know we all sometimes worship at the altar of social media. For some of us, we need to tear down the altar and return back to the true biblical one that is rooted in Christ. And allow our faith to be reassured again in the witness and testimony that we have in Jesus Christ. And some of us need to remember to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord to know that our labor for him is not in vain. But what about those who are not sure and on the edge about this truth. Those who are watching online, I just want to talk to you. Maybe you're watching in your living room. Maybe you're watching on your smartphone and you're on the edge. But you've heard a clear witness that everything that has been said about Jesus Christ has been affirmed and is true. And maybe you're waiting for an invitation to come into the kingdom. What well, Jesus has given you one. He says, come all who are weary and I will give you rest. You're wrestling with your sin. You're trying to do this all on your own. Maybe you're trying in your own good works and you keep falling flat on your face. Maybe that is God and his graciousness trying to show you that you can't do it on your own. 
but he's giving you a witness that is clear. And he says, come to me. Maybe you're in this room in the same way. And we're good at playing church in America. We know how to be, as I like to call it, churchy Le Pew. It looks good, but if you get a closer look, it's just a skunk. Is that where you find yourself? But Jesus specializes in transformation. He takes the old and makes it new. He takes the broken and heals. And maybe you find yourself on the outside and you know Christ is calling you to come in. Can we bow our heads in this moment? You've heard the witness and Christ is calling you to himself. If you know you're not born again this morning, if you know you've not placed your faith and trust in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've been playing around and haven't fully said yes to him, maybe you're watching online and you want to respond to this. With our head bows and our eyes closed, Maybe you're in this room and you need to respond and ask Christ to save you. I'd love to pray for you and pray with you. But maybe you don't know what to pray. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. A prayer to the Father. And you accept any who come in humility. With your head bowed and your eyes closed. If you need to accept Christ as Savior... Maybe you want to respond to this. Maybe you want to just raise your hand up in the air to say, yes, that is me. I need Christ. You can put it up high to say, yes, I'm responding to Jesus. If you don't know what to pray, you can pray a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. I recognize my need for a Savior. I come to you humbly and ask for forgiveness. I turn to follow you from this day forward to be obedient disciple. I'm yours. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that there are those who have placed their faith and trust in you. Lord, I pray that they would respond rightly and let us know Lord, I pray for those who are struggling even in their faith that they will be reassured that the witness that they have, it is true. Lord, give us the boldness to live out this life for your glory. It's in Jesus' name, amen.